Hi folks, I'm Hector Garcia. I'm a CPA and one of the most common questions I get from my customers is, should I classify this worker as an employee or an independent contractor? And in this video, I'm gonna dive deep into both the IRS rules and the state related rules, plus all the potential business implications of choosing one or the other. As a matter of fact, the number one most common misnomer is business owners think that this is a choice that business owners make or employees make. That's actually not true. There's a specific set of rules that determine whether or not the employee or the worker is going to be classified as one or the other. So we're gonna deep dive into that. Now, even though I'm a CPA and I think I give pretty good tax advice, I would strongly recommend that you work with your own CPA when it comes to any specific tax questions that pertain to your business. Also, if there's legal questions, you should never take a CPA advice. You should always take a lawyer's advice on that. So let's jump right to it. In this video, we're going to cover why this matters, the motivations of either an employee or a business to be classified as one or the other, the IRS rules. We're going to talk about some state rules. We'll specifically talk about the California new AB5 rule, which is really important, just came into existence January 1st. 2020. We're going to talk about the business requirements when working with an independent contractor and then some of the tips I give to my own clients about how to deal with independent contractors. So let's start with why this matters. So the reason why this matters is potential legal implications. What do I mean by that? If you have an employee that has agency or has the ability to act in behalf of the business, that employee could essentially get that business into trouble, right, by doing the wrong thing. An independent contractor typically is there for the short term and does not represent the business itself. Now, there are certain uh, business transactions, maybe you're doing construction for the government or something like that, and the specific contract will require you to use an independent contractor, a specific independent contractor, or to use an employee. So you have to consider, are there legal implications of using an employee or an independent contractor based on your business or based on the specific transaction. We also have tax or cost implications, probably the most typical one where a business has to pay payroll taxes and have the administrative burden of having to run payroll. When it's an employee, most businesses wanna just sort of avoid that and just write the independent contractor a check and not have to deal with all that. So that's an important tax and cost implication. Another one is, risk or insurance implications. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have an employee, the business itself has a bit more risk, but also does the employee have risk? What if the, uh, the employee or the worker gets hurt on the job? You know, what, what if they hurt somebody else on the job? So is that employee, uh, employee insured? Does the insurance cover that employee? Does the insurance cover that independent contractor? What about workers' compensation? All that stuff is really important. We also have administrative implications, as I mentioned earlier, not, not just paying the payroll tax, but keeping up with timesheets, paychecks, the, all the documentation that you have to keep on the employee. Administratively, it's a bit more work to work with employees versus independent contractors, which is just basically a check for an invoice type of transaction. Then we have operating implications. So for example, independent contractors work per contract, they work short term. So it's, it's more difficult to manage long term labor with independent contractors versus having employees in which they're pretty much there. They work full time. They're available for you as a business to do whatever it is that you need them to do. Uh, an independent contractor might be, operatively speaking, might be a bit more restrictive of what they can do, when they can do it, and the type of work that they're going to do. Then we have unemployment implications, right? If you have an employee and you have to displace them, they're going to go straight to the unemployment compensation office, try to get an unemployment check uh, before they find the next job. So as a, as, an, as, a, as a business, if you are having employees, you have to understand that that's going to happen. If you have independent contractors, an independent contractor doesn't know or understand that they are not an employee, they might also walk into that unemployment office and claim to be an employee just so they can try to collect an unemployment check and they'll basically be a whistleblower and then you're gonna have the State Department, Labor Department, IRS, uh, and any other compliance office 
at your business trying to figure out why is this independent contractor that you quote fired trying to get an unemployment check when they're actually classified as an independent contractor, but the, the worker is claiming to be an employee, it can get messy. So just keep that in mind because most employees are gonna try to do what's best for them, not what's best for the business, especially if they get fired or displaced. And lastly, we have potential penalties. So you can get penalties from the IRS, from the state, especially if there's state payroll taxes. You're gonna have uh, Department of Labor, potential penalties for not paying overtime or not giving enough breaks or not giving enough pay time off. Whatever the state requirements are, the Department of Labor typically enforces that. And there are other compliance entities, lo local government entities that try to enforce that. Most of the times, depending on the state, some states are a bit more employee friendly and they'll side with the employee if there's a discrepancy of any sort. So make sure to consider that as well. Let's talk about the motivations. What are the specific motivations a business or a business owner may have to classify their workers as employee? Well, one of the most important ones is exclusivity. I want that employee to work full time for me. I want them to grow inside of our business. I want them to keep our trade secrets. I want them to understand how we operate. I want them to sign a non-disclosure. I want them to sign a non-compete, although non-competes and oftentimes are are not enforceable in the court of law. But generally speaking is I want an employee that knows what we what we do, the unique things that we do, and it's not gonna go out there and repeat it and do it for uh, the competition. You also wanna attract or retain talent. Talented people might want to work for a company that's going to give them job security, that will give them long-term career path, training, that sort of thing. So if you have unique training, if you have a unique know-how, you want these people to be employees because you want them to take that training and work exactly as you want them to work to fit into your business or corporate culture. Then we also have uh, using uh, your own equipment. So as a business owner, you want them to use your truck, your tools, your computers, your software, your equipment, because you have a specific process to deliver that product or service. You don't want them to come in with their own tools. Most of the time, independent contractors are probably going to do what's most efficient for them, not necessarily what's best for the business. So if you want them to use your own tools and use them in the specific way that you need them to use it, they, need, they might need to be an employee. Now, let's talk about motivations for a business to classify the workers as an independent contractor. So the other side of the coin here. So number one, save on payroll taxes, right? So I don't have to pay IRS, state uh, payroll taxes, unemployment taxes, and every state has their own type of local payroll type of tax that the businesses have to pay. You will save that because independent contractors, you just pay, write them a check for the amount that you contractually agreed to pay and that's it, versus employees, they get a bit more expensive. Now we also have employee benefits. So you might have four or five employees that get health insurance, 401k, whatever type of benefits you have, you don't want those independent contractors to fall into that group. So you want to separate the independent contractors from the employees for the purpose of paying benefits. Also workers' compensation insurance. So most of the times, most businesses will uh, give workers' comp insurance to their employees, in-house employees, but not to their independent contractors. Depending on the industry, you may have to cover them uh, in construction. For example, in some states, you as a business, if you contract someone, you might have to cover them unless they have their own insurance or they have an insurance exception, and this varies by state. But pretty much workers' compensation can get pretty expensive, and business owners want to avoid paying that whenever possible, so that might be a motivation to classify them. Also, being able to terminate the worker with ease, right? Terminate the contract, not hire them again, right? In some states, it's a little bit harder. You may have to keep more documentation in order to fire or get rid of an employee. So it's really, really important to understand that independent contractors are short-term and you can get rid of them fairly quickly. Not, not having to pay overtime is kind of an important perk. Uh, so not having to pay times and a half or whatever the contractual amount is because they're an independent contractor, not an employee. It's a big feature of having an independent contractor. Also having casual or temporary labor, so not having to pay a full paycheck each month. Just pay them when you need them. Uh, pay them when whenever you, you have more work when you have uh, capa your capacity goes down, 
bring some extra help, some extra casual labor. That's another uh, motivation to have independent contractors. Also, having them bring their own equipment, provide their own training. In other words, independent contractors, they come ready or they should come ready. They should have their own equipment and they should be trained to do the job. So that's not an additional expense that the business owner or the business has to incur. And finally, the illusion of paying a bigger paycheck. So a lot of independent contractors, they actually like getting the, the bigger paycheck, quote unquote, because there's no payroll taxes. And the businesses themselves want to give the illusion that they're paying that person and more that they would otherwise pay in them as an employee. So that's kind of a strange motivation, but it's out there. I've seen many uh, business owners do that. Now let's talk about motivations for an employee to be classified as such. So why would an employee want to be an employee? So number one, job security, fixed schedule, guaranteed hours, that sort of thing. It's probably the most important one, the one that comes to mind. The second one is getting benefits. As a matter of fact, many companies offer benefits mostly to keep employees and attract attract that talent, right? So health insurance, 401k, whatever those benefits might be, that might also be a motivation for the employee not to become independent, to stay as an employee of the business. Also having a career path, so having a clear uh, future about how you can get better and better, get paid more and grow inside of a business, get trained uh, by that employer uh, perpetually. It's so, sort of one of the reasons why employees want to become an employee or or maintain staying as an employee. Also being able to provide all the equipment, all the tools. Most employees don't buy or bring their own tools. There's some industries like mechanics, for example, they typically have their own tools or chefs, they're gonna have their own knives. This is more of a personal preference, but they're not required to do so. So they don't have to make the out-of-pocket expense typically when they're an employee. Now, what about half of your payroll taxes? So generally, especially your IRS taxes, they're paid, half of the payroll taxes are paid by the employer. When you're an independent contractor, you're gonna be, pay, be paying a bit more taxes because uh, you're gonna be paying the full portion of payroll taxes, which is typically 15.3% of your salary, regardless of your salary uh, grade or your salary level, you're gonna pay at least 15.3% of that salary as payroll taxes, and typically that gets split between the employer and the employee. So it's kinda nice as an employee not to have to pay half of that. And then we have simplicity, right? So I'm an employee, when I file my tax return, I have a W-2, I will probably get a refund of some sort, I don't have to keep up with my mileage, my expenses, uh, business deductions, that sort of thing. So it's just simplicity because my employer is going to withhold my income taxes. And finally, if I get displaced, if I get fired, I can possibly get unemployment benefits until I find my next job. So that's a sort of a, sort of a hidden benefit or uh, um, a potential benefit of being an employee, is being able to get the unemployment check if you lose your job. Now, what are the motivations for an independent contractor to be classified as such? So I'm a worker and I want to be an independent contractor. I don't want to be an employee. What will motivate me to do so? Now, the ability to deduct business expenses from income in my Schedule C in my tax return. So typically, employees that get W-2s, they can deduct that many things from their taxes. So independent contractors that have vehicle expenses, cell phone home office expenses, those things, they typically can be deducted from that gross income and reduce that, that taxable amount. So even though they might be paying more in payroll taxes, they could be possibly paying a lot less in income taxes because they have all those business deductions. Now watch in the description, I'm gonna put a link to those typical business deductions that a lot of my customers ask me for, for, that, for independent contractors or business owners. You can also check out section 162 in the IRS tax code, which specifically speaks about what is deductible uh, to reduce uh, your taxable business income. Now, getting a larger paycheck, as I mentioned earlier, the illusion of a larger paycheck by not getting federal withholding, state withholding, payroll tax withholding, it will give you a bigger paycheck amount, quote unquote. So it gives you that illusion of that bigger dollar amount. Now this could work to your detriment as an independent contractor if you don't keep up with expenses or don't have any expenses, but at least on the moment you get paid, you sort of feel like you're getting paid more versus being an employee. Now flexible schedule, right? independent contractors typically have a bit more flexible schedule. Most of the times the, the, uh, the business or the employer will tell you 
the deadline or the specific times that you can work in. But generally speaking, there's a lot more flexibility with schedule versus a typical W-2, 9 to 5 job. Now, we also have multiple clients, so having multiple income sources. Typically, independent contractors don't work full time for one entity. They have multiple entities they work with or they have multiple types of income sources. So if you want that, that might be your motivation as well. Now, being able to use your own tools and equipment, if you prefer that, being able to invest on whatever type of training that you want, being able to determine what does being productive mean from your own perspective as an independent contractor could also be a typical motivator for a worker to be an independent contractor. And lastly, that independent contractor might want to build a business or a brand around that specific skill set. Now let's move on to IRS rules because this is not, as I mentioned earlier, this is not a choice. This is not, oh, I choose to be an employee or I choose to be an independent contractor or the business chooses to pay them as a 1099 contractor. It doesn't work that way. You have to follow specific rules and figure out based on the rules how to determine what that worker status is. So IRS rules is really broken down into three categories. One, behavioral control. We're going to go deep into this. Two, financial control. And three, relationship or type of relationship. So let's go deep into each one of these. Behavioral control. So a worker is an employee when a business has the right to direct uh, the control performed by the worker. So some examples are type of instructions given. So is that employer or is that business giving them specific instructions on how to do the work, how to perform the work, what tools to use, that sort of thing. Second is the degree of instruction. So if you have an independent contractor, you have to tell them more or less what you want and how you want it. But if you give them detail how to and have specific requirements of how they're going to perform every part, every task of their job, that's going to gear more towards employee versus independent contractor. Now, evaluation system, are you evaluating that employee? Are you evaluating their efficiency, their productivity? Are you doing annual reviews? Are you doing monthly reviews? Are you doing six-month reviews? Are you treating that person as an employee where you're evaluating what they do and how how do they do it every single time? If you're doing that, that may gear more tip the scale more towards employee. And finally, are you training? So are you training them specifically on how to do the job? Now, showing them once how to do it and then letting them finish, that's generally okay. But having this ongoing training and ongoing quality control is probably going to tip the scale more towards employee versus independent contractor. Now we have financial control. So does the business have financial control or control over the financial aspects of the worker's job. So for example, is the business investing in equipment, right, in the tools that the worker uses? Or is it significant enough? Or is it is it pretty certain that most of the equipment, the vast majority of the equipment or the principal equipment that that worker is using is paid for or financed by that employer? If that's the case, the, it will tip more towards employee. What about unreimbursed expenses? So typically an employee, if they have to pay toll or they have to uh, pay for something in behalf of the, the business or their employer, they're going to get that reimbursed where independent contractors typically give a contract price uh, or the, the, uh, their actual rate for the job and all the expenses are incurred by them and that's their own uh, problem, right? It's their own expenses, it's their own issue that they have to keep control of, and it's or sort of implied within the contract that all those expenses are going to be paid for by the independent contractor. Now, some contracts may uh, call for specific out-of-pocket on reimbursed expenses, and that's okay, but generally speaking, most employees get unreimbursed expenses refunded and workers or independent contractors do not. Now, the opportunity for profit or loss. If you're an independent contractor, you should be able to lose if you screw up, if you have to do it twice, if you use the wrong equipment, if you use the wrong tools, if you worked inefficiently. In other words, the independent contractor has to be its own business. And the, the contract said, 
this is the final work, this is the price, regardless of what it costs that independent contractor to do it, they must complete it, they're contractually obligated to complete it. With an employee, typically if the employee screws up, they'll just keep working and do it again, and typically they get paid by the hour anyway, or they get a short paycheck no matter what. So most of the times employees really don't lose on any sort of employer-employee transaction. Now, are the services available to the market? In other words, does that independent contractor offer this to other people as well, right? If they're exclusive and you as the business is the only business that that independent contractor works for, that's going to tip the scale more towards employee. But if the independent contractor works with several businesses, offers similar services to the competition, potentially, uh, that's going to tip the scale more towards independent contractor. And method of payment. So is that person being paid weekly at the same time as all the employees with the payroll checks? Are they being paid by the hour? Are they turning in timesheets? If that's the case, that tips the scale towards employee. But if, if you are paying that independent contractor based on the invoice, based on the job, based on the contract, that tips the scale more towards independent contractor. Now, relationship. Now, what about the relationship? So the type of relationship that an employer and worker have matters. So for example, are there written contracts? So are there executed contracts, written contracts, contracts that an independent person could go back and look at and say, yeah, this absolutely shows that these are two independent parties doing business with each other. Are there benefits? Is that employer paying employee-like benefits to that uh, independent contractor? Are they being invited to the team meetings? Are they being invited to the end of the year meetings? All those things matter when it comes to that relationship. Now, the permanency of the relationship is important. So is this a short-term contract or is it implied that they'll be doing business with each other forever all year long? So if it's a short-term contract or it's implied that it's not a permanent relationship here on, you work, work exclusively for me and work with me forever, uh, then it tips more towards independent contractor. But if it's a sort of a, a relationship that's a forever relationship, a career type of relationship, that's going to tip the scale a lot more towards an employee. And then finally, you know, are the services provided key activity of the business? So a restaurant couldn't have a cook or a server as an independent contractor, even if it's for one day, because cooking the food and serving the food, it's a key part of running that business. So typically you have independent contractors do extraordinary work, not the key services of that business. Now, this is probably one of the ones that gets abused the most because most of the times, anyone you hire as a business owner does a key thing, regard, I mean, and, and some subjectiveness to what's key, right? What's important, what's a principal uh, service that the business provides. But this was a bit more subject to uh, to scrutiny. But again, you, you have to, you're going to have to weigh in all of these things, right? Financial control, behavior control, relationship control. And it doesn't have to be all of these. They're just all considered at the same time. Now, there's a form that you can download in the IRS is form SS8. It's called the termination of worker status for the purposes of federal employment taxes and income tax withholding. So if you download this form, you can download it right off the IRS website. I'll put a link in the description below. That is the actual form that the IRS would use to investigate a classification issue. So for example, we have an uh, uh, independent contractor that calls the IRS and says, hey, this person's treating me as independent contractor, although they're an employee, and they'll start an investigation. They'll require them to send the SS8 form filled out. It's got several pages, many, many questions in there. And both parties, all the parties involved, have to fill out the form. And then a third party, an impartial person, will look at them and then determine whether you know one smells more like employee or smells more like independent contractor. And it starts from there. So if you have any doubts about what is the IRS going to think about this specific worker? Uh, you can look at the form and just sort of answer them on your own and see whether your answers tip the scale more towards employee or independent contractor. Now, state rules. Every state can have different labor rules affecting overtime, pay leave, break policy, uh, type of insurance, re required insurance, required licenses, 
wage garnishment procedures. This will vary state by state. So unfortunately, I can't get into every single state on this video, but I think it's worth mentioning that some states might be more contractor friendly and more uh, employee friendly. What that means is typically if the state collects revenue, so if you have a state that collects income taxes at the state level, uh, those are typically going to be more employee friendly because they're going to want to enforce employees so they can collect uh, payroll taxes. I mean, that shouldn't be a surprise. And then some states that don't collect that much when it comes to uh, payroll taxes or payroll benefits like Florida. Florida only collects uh, Florida unemployment. They're a lot more lax on the rules. Not that they break the rules or they don't follow them. It's just that they're not, they don't have as many strict uh, procedures and they tend to follow more of the IRS standard. But specifically, California, uh, starting January 1st, 2020, they passed a law last year, the AB5 is called, which really re uh, creates a new set of restrictions for uh, California corporations or any corporation employing in California that might uh, push or tip the scale more towards employee versus independent contractor. California, it's an employee-friendly uh, state. So they'll side more with the employee when there's a dispute. So let's talk briefly about uh, California's AB5. I'm not an attorney and I'm not licensed in California, so I can't get uh, heavily into the details. But as I mentioned, this takes place January 1st, 2020, affects uh, businesses as of that date. And there's a three-part, what they call the ABC test. And this is going to not necessarily override the IRS, but this is going to sit on top of the IRS rules. So one, does the hiring entity have control over how the work, how the worker performs the work? The IRS has the same exact rule, so that they control the training, the, the detailed instructions, that sort of thing. Then we have, is the work performed outside usual course of business? So is that an employee doing a main product or service that the business offers, like the example of the restaurant and the cook and the server, or is it something sort of outside the main core of what that business offers? And three, is that worker engaged in business with other entities? Are they offering the services with, uh, to potentially competitors, someone else? And this, this three-part test is all three. So it's not like the IRS where there's the, the three that we mentioned and all the details and the SS8 form with all the questions and it's just one sort of the scale tips one way or the other. California, it's about meeting all three of these. So there's a lot less rules, but you have to meet all three. So, so if you work in California and you're not sure if, if your business qualifies or not, you may want to work with sort of a local CPA, a local uh, attorney to make sure that in your particular case, you're not breaking any rules when it comes to these new AB5. Now, let's talk about uh, employer requirements when working independent with independent contractors. So number one, collect a W-9 form. You can just Google W-9, collect a W-9 form from the independent contractor that's going to have their name, address, and social security number before you make the first payment. Just say, look, I can't release the payment until I get W-9 form. Because typically what ends up happening is you pay that contractor all year long, you ignore this whole concept, then you go to your accountant, your accountant asks you for the W-9 form, and then the contractor is nowhere to be found. So now you can have a compliance problem because you can't file a 1099 without the W-9 form that contains that IRS information, IRS required information from the independent contractor. So have them give you the W-9 before you issue that first check. Now the second one is you might need to separate the difference between compensating that worker for work performed versus purchasing inventory for them or reimbursing them for supplies or contractually stated out-of-pocket expenses because you're only going to include in the 1099 the labor portion if you have a relationship with that contractor where you pay them both labor and parts or labor and inventory that sort of thing now when you issue uh, the form er, by january 31st of the following year you must issue a 1099 miscellaneous form uh, this is for tax year 2019 and then for tax year 2020 and beyond it's going to be the 1099 nec form they changed the form i don't know why they just did for so for this tax year uh, that just finished 2019 for the 2020 uh, portion of 
tax preparation, you're going to do a 1099 miscellaneous, but the next year on 2021, for the year, tax year 2020, you'll be doing a 1099 NEC. The forms are similar, it's the same mechanics, but anyway, you have to file that form by January 31st of that following year, and you have to file it to the IRS and then give a copy to that contractor. I suggest that you get a so some sort of proof that that contractor received it, that way there's no hearsay afterwards that they didn't get the form or whatever. And then lastly, only checks, payments in cash, or electronic transfers that are not paid through a merchant processor are included there. In other words, if you're paying that independent contractor through PayPal, or you pay them with a credit card and they're using a merchant processor, you will not issue a 1099 for those type of payments because the PayPal or the credit card processor is actually responsible for reporting that. So the IRS doesn't want to see duplications, a 1099 from the, from the employer, from the business, and the 1099K from the uh, PayPal or merchant processor. So keep in mind that if you're not paying them with a check or wire transfer or cash, and you're doing some sort of merchant credit card payment, you might not have to issue a 1099, or at least partially for those funds, you wouldn't have to. Now, lastly, what are the tips that I give to all my customers, all my clients, when it comes to working with independent contractors? So this is key right here. Right here, this is what my my, my uh, customers pay me for, for my advice. So I'm giving this advice for you for free, proactively. So one is, have a signed contract up front. Make sure the independent contractor signs a contract with the business. The contract states the relationship. It states their independence. And it states that it's temporary, that it's based on a specific job or a specific uh, limit in time, right? Not a, It's not a permanent uh, contract. It's, it's, a, it's a short-term contract. And typically, that contract will help you save face. The, all the other tests matter. All the other... Uh, IRS and state rules matter, but that contract itself sets the tone, sets the pace in the event if there's an audit or an investigation of some sort. Second, make sure these contractors bring their own tools, bring their own equipment. They're fully trained. They know how to perform the work. You're not going to be on top of them. You're not going to put a supervisor on top of them. Let them dictate their own schedule. Even though you have deadlines, they can still work uh, they can still have their own schedule and make sure that they always have a risk of losing on their side. If they screw up, they have to do it again. They lose, not you. And that, that also, it's just a good business uh, tip altogether, but make sure that the contract itself and customarily in the, in, the, in the course of transacting with them, make sure that they can lose if they do things wrong, if they make mistakes. The other one is make sure that you're working with people that are insured they're licensed, they're permitted. Make sure they have the legal capacity to do that work. Because if you have a copy of their license, a copy of their insurance, a copy of their permits, and you can prove to them that they are in that line of business and that's what they do for a living. They do that for multiple businesses. It's not that you drag them in as an employee and want to pay them as an independent contractor to save money on taxes or whatever, that this is a customary thing. This is a usual course of business for the both of you. Now, I would say as a bonus, work with independent contractors that are incorporated, that have their own LLC, that have their own S corporation, that have their own corporations. You're not paying them individually, you're paying them through their business. That's going to reduce most of the risk uh, to the, to the uh, employer. Now, the IRS and the state is always going to look for stuff, substance over form. So just having a corporation and just having the contract doesn't necessarily fix the whole situation. That relationship test and that financial control, that behavior control, all that stuff still matter, uh, still matters. But I think for the most part, again, it sets the tone that these are two independent parties working with each other. Also, let the contractor dictate payment terms, right? They're going to invoice you and they're going to tell you by when you need to pay them. Don't issue their paychecks at the same time as you issue your payroll checks. Don't have the independent contractor come every Friday, make the same line as the employees do to collect their paycheck. And most importantly, don't call it a paycheck. It's not a payroll check. It's, a, it's an invoice payment. So make sure that's a really important thing. Also, no timesheets, right? They should not be keeping any timesheets. Timekeeping should be their own issue. They should be invoicing. They can invoice you for their time, but they cannot be using the same timesheets that you use 
to control the hours of your internal employees. That's going to tip the scale way towards employee versus independent contractor. And finally, don't call them an employee. Don't call them a team member, right? So if you make them think that they're an employee, if you make them think they're a team member, even though you've done all these other things to, to make sure you pay them as a contractor, they're still going to show up to the unemployment line when you dis when, when you stop paying them. And they're going to say, my employer, which I, it was, you know, that's what they called me. They called me an employee and, you know, I was part of the team. They stopped paying me. Now let me collect my unemployment check. So anyway, I hope you like this video. I'm going to create a whole series of these really sort of top level tax tips that small business owners need to keep in mind to keep their taxes compliant and save as much taxes as legally possible. So make sure you click on subscribe, you hit like, you share this video with other people and go in the comments below. Tell me what I didn't cover. Tell me what the next video should be all about. And thank you and I'll see you in the next one.